Um, so hi everyone, I'm Anupama Maram. I'm the senior product lead at Harvard Catalyst. Um, so like Griffin mentioned last year, our team released a brand new Shrine interface, and this is currently supported on our production network. Um, when we first started this project, our assumption was that these, um, the new novice users that would be coming to the network wouldn't necessarily be familiar with I2B2 or know how to use raw EHR data. And so our main objective was to build out a more intuitive, user-friendly interface that was um, incorporated modern standards of design, usability, look and feel, and also address um, accessibility concerns. Um, because the project was one year long, when we released 3.0, we only had selected functionality. Um, and so we were supporting two web clients, the legacy web client, which you see here, and the new web, web client, which I will be demoing. Um, and we selected, features that were the most valuable to those novice users and then supporting the use case of uh, patient cohort discovery and determining study feasibility. Um, and here I just wanted to focus on that the work that we did um, was you know, actively writing the software, but also um, a product discovery phase. So we were researching and refining the scope of the project to establish our business goals. Um, working with the UI working group to understand what a successful outcome would be and carrying out user research like Griffin had showed in his slides. Um, so again, I just wanted to point out that the working group was really instrumental in helping to make, uh, helping us to make pivotal decisions in the design and requirement process. Um, our second goal uh, was to address, um, to address and help users uh, find their concepts. So the medical concept list had over 2 million concepts. Um, and now the current version contains a COVID addendum and also two new branches, which is the social determinants of health and the vital status branch. Um, so we wanted to make it so that um, that researchers could find the concept they were looking for, but we knew that you know, searching through 2 million concepts would be pretty burdensome. So we wanted to make our search robust and so they can quickly locate like the needle and haystack concept. So I'll be doing a uh, full demo of 3.0 and 3.1 um, this afternoon. So if you haven't seen it, I suggest coming to that session. Um, but specifically for um, this UI session, I wanted to focus on the work that the team did for the 3.1 release. And this release is now um, ready, uh, ready for production. So some key features. Um, we heard from the community that there was a need for a CSV of the site counts. So we included exactly that in this release. So you can download a CSV um, of all of the sites and the counts and it's in a two column layout. Uh, we also are providing flexibility in rearranging concepts. Prior to 3.1, um, users could only drag concepts from the medical concept panel to the um, inclusion exclusion criteria boxes, but we now made it easier to drag and drop um, all over the panel. Uh, for the 3.1 release, we've deprecated support for the legacy web client. Uh, and again, we'll be addressing this in the roadmap session uh, this afternoon. Um, but like I mentioned, because it was a year long contract for 3.0, we couldn't include all of the features from legacy in the new web client. So in 3.1, we had some bandwidth to address these gaps. For both demographic distributions, which were formerly known as breakdowns um, and event-based queries known as temporal queries, we reached out to this group like Griffin mentioned and worked with other stakeholders to understand what aspects of these features worked and which areas could use improvements. We also had the additional challenge of how to integrate these complex features into the new, new UI. Um, we branded the, the new UI for novice users. Um, so when we included these advanced features, we wanted to make sure it was discoverable and intuitive enough for those novice users, but uh, robust to address the needs for those um, advanced users. All right, so let's get started with our demo. So I've already logged in um, and I'm sure you'll notice uh, two things here. So we now have a when 
radio button up here in our inclusion and exclusion panel. And then we now have this checkbox um, for including demographic distributions. So I'm gonna go here and I'm just randomly gonna drag over a couple of concepts. I do wanna point out this new uh, vital status, um, medical domain and social determinants of health. Um, and so, you know, as I'm creating this panel, I'm dragging concepts from the left to the right. Um, if I realize that this isn't actually the right combination of concepts in this first panel, I can just um, drag this concept here and fill it out below. So it gives me a lot of flexibility in terms of constructing uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria. So down below, I'm going to go ahead and run this query and I'm going to um, check this box to include demographic distributions. Um, I'm not sure if you recall in the legacy UI, but when we were selecting breakdowns, you had to select every type of breakdown. And instead, we're streamlining that process with one simple click. So I'm gonna go ahead and count patients. So while that's running, I'll show you a, a previous um, example here. Um, actually, hold on one second. Yeah, let me go to another example. So here you'll see uh, the a new section appears, this demographic distribution. And so um, while this is running, the charts will actually grow in response to uh, the data as it's coming in. So it dynamically changes as a pretty cool interaction. Um, we removed um, the uh, graphs per site per breakdown feature and instead created four aggregate uh, charts. Um, the feedback we got was that we learned that the individual site charts in the legacy UI were not particularly helpful and weren't really useful to include in grant documentation. So in this first iteration, we've created four aggregate charts. So we have the distribution by age, uh, by sex, by race and by vital status. So the idea here is that it provides the researcher a high level overview. Um, and if they do wanna get that granular detail, they can download this site specific demographic distribution CSV, and that will allow them to drill further down and perform their own analysis and create the kind of charts that they can use. And up here, um, this is the, uh, link to download a CSV of the site results. So it will look exactly like the layout you see in this data table. Let's see if this ever, yeah, so you can sort of see, I think I just chose some random terms. That's why I didn't work that great. Um, so before I switch over to event-based queries, um, I wanted to highlight the difference between an event-based query and um, a normal query. So in this example here, I have three inclusion panels, which is listed out here. The first panel contains multiple concepts to describe the age range of interest. The patients in this specific cohort that I'm looking for must have had COVID and also um, a diagnosis of diabetes. I could have specified a date range or multiple occurrences for the second and third panel, um, but I didn't in this case. And this is just showing, you know, I just wanted to highlight an example of a non-event query. I reran this criteria and I changed it to um, an event-based query. So the difference you can see here is also in the verbiage of the query. So the second and third are slightly different. The readable query format states a sequence of events for the patient in this cohort, specifically to locate patients with a diagnosis of diabetes. Um, and you know, I further specified a start range here in the year 2000. Um, and this had to have occurred before um, the first occurrence of COVID. So I'm gonna go ahead and reload this criteria back into the query builder so I can show you how we constructed it. So again, I'll point out, we had that new when radio button. Um, so notice that this panel has a slightly different layout than the um, inclusion and exclusion panel. Um, we also uh, 
use two indicators that it's slightly different. So we have this yellow color kind of cautioning the user to slow down and, and fill out the panel according to the instructions we have here. And also this clock icon to sort of signify there's a time aspect to it. Um, for each query, so for every single inclusion exclusion criteria that the user defines, they can only have one event-based panel. So since this is a current active um, event-based panel, you'll notice here I'm disabled and prevented from selecting it. Um, for each event-based uh, panel, they are a maximum of two events and they both must be specified. So if I delete this concept here, it's telling me I have to drag a concept to define the second event in the sequence. So go ahead and drag a random concept. Um, and I can build out this uh, event panel um, as I do a normal inclusion exclusion panel so that all of these events are related to one another by use of the or logical operator. And you'll notice here that for each event, I can continue to specify a date range. Um, what you'll notice is that I actually cannot specify uh, an occurrence. So for example, here, um, for a regular inclusion exclusion panel, I can specify multiple occurrences, but a user can't do that for a uh, event-based query. Um, again, we wanted to continue that top-down um, format so the user can read and comprehend what exactly they're doing. So here it's find patients when the first occurrence of event one occurs before the first occurrence of event two. So it's really playing out, it's really playing out the sequence, um, the start sequence and the end sequence. And then in the middle, we have the relationship between the two events. So it defaults to, um, you know, just occurs anytime before the first event, but if you wanted to specify a specific time gap, you can go ahead and specify, enter um, a unit of um, an integer and then uh, select a unit of time to specify the gap between the first and second event. And you'll see that it still maintains the ability to uh, be able to read, um, to read that, uh, the query. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this. Um, so yeah, I can go ahead and, and run this query. I can select to include demographic distributions if I had wanted to. Um, usually temporal queries take some time to come back from the network. And then again, you'll see that uh, immediately relayed in the qu query um, criteria here. So that's the demo that I had for 3.1 features. I'm happy to take any questions. And again, I'll be doing a full demo of all of the, the entire product um, this afternoon. So if you're interested, um, I will see you then. I think Michelle has a question about um, uh, being able to query on the same encounter. So, do you want to answer this, Anna Palmer, or should I? Um, do you mind taking that, Griffin? I, I, I yeah, maybe I'm so, not understanding so it. This, so, so here she, what she's doing here is equivalent to when you do a um, like an actual temporal query in ITB2, where it's relative to the date. We don't have a thing here where it's linking in the same encounter number or the same instance. Um, you know those other the temporal. Um, um, options that are inside of the ITBT user interface. Anna Palmer, do you know what you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, so there's um there, there's like a same encounter query you know, at any time an independent temple option, a same encounter option, um, a same instance option if you're trying to do like modifiers and stuff. And then there's like temple query and temple query and ITB2 it switches the whole separate UI where you're sort of defining instance A and B and it's, it's doing relative to the date. Um, same encounter has nothing to do with a date. It's looking at the billing code that was 
um, kind of associated with a fact and linking them together. Um, so that is used as sort of used that to try to find things that occurred, for example, in the same hospital visit. But you know, it's kind of it's just an approximation because a lot of times a hospital visit might have multiple encounter numbers as part of it, so it doesn't always um, work as well. So it is or is not. So it's not in trying anymore. This, this user interface does not include um, same encounter or same instance um, queries. Okay, because like uh, Jim had used that as in one of his queries that he demoed earlier. So I was wondering. Right. I mean, we. And I no, do it as a short post, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's lots of kind of advanced features in ITB2 and ontologies that um, need that. I think the approach, you know, what Amazon Tom was saying was that we're starting out with novice users um, and sort of really stripping it down to basic stuff they needed for an app query and then adding things in um, over time to make it, you know, allow more complex query capabilities and trying to replace ultimately the, um, you know, ITB2 web client. So, you know, that's, that's a piece that's missing from here. I think that's related or modifiers, you know, you need the same instance to handle modifiers, but this UI doesn't really do modifiers right now either. So you know, it, I imagine we'll get to that at some point, but you know, the, the first path of um, temple queries, the use cases that I think came up in um, um, focus groups or asking people was um, this right. type of temple query. So um, I, I didn't know if I heard it right. Did she say the uh, legacy client is retired? Yeah, so we are no longer, it's it's available, but we're no longer uh, coding or supporting it anymore. But it, 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 it'll still work even if you keep advancing your new web client? I, um, I think the plan, I think the plan is to ultimately not have to support the old one anymore because it just makes all the releases more complicated you know, we have to figure out when are we at that point um, you know i think there's still more that needs to be added to the new client in order to capture you know the functionality that's needed there may ultimately be things plugins for the old web client that are so complicated to add to the new one it makes sense sometimes to just drop it focus on the ability to, uh, to add new functionality more quickly. My screen. Well, we're getting close to the end of time, right? Yes. I'll go through this real fast. All right, future topics. This is the same slide I've, um, I've been using for a couple of years. I kind of tweak and add to it each year. We have three different broad topics, building queries, um, UI elements related to understanding the data quality and data insights into the, um, into the data. And then just sort of general functionality like um, um, uh, single sign-on and APIs. Um, things in red over here, things we looked at over the past year, temporal queries and timelines. And then things that I think I added just this for this year in blue, which I think is going to be really important considering the new um, long COVID work that we're doing, is being able to figure out how to display pointers to external objects, so how to bring images, notes, specimen information into the UIs being able to query for specimens and other entity types instead of just patients. Um, and then we have a lot of algorithms kind of behind the scenes for uh, running fast queries, record linkage, small counts, and the stuff that needs to be presented to the user and where do we put those data elements. And then on data quality and data insights, as um, you know, Jeff Klein and others creating total num scripts and we're collecting other information about data quality, how does that get presented in the ontology and displayed to the user? So they understand um, uh, aspects of the data as they're building their queries. So we'll go through this in a lot more detail over the next year at our user interface meetings. And we hope you um, join us there if you're a current member and if you are interested in joining us for the website and um, sign up. We look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Thank you, everyone.